Human Rights Watch has called on Nigerian authorities to suspend the closure of internally displaced people's camps, hosting nearly two million people in the northeastern city of Maiduguri. The rights group says that many of those who've been resettled were not offered suitable housing. The Boko Haram conflict has displaced over 2.9 million people in Nigeria's northeast and hundreds of thousands set to neighboring countries. Most of the internally displaced people are in Borno state, the epicenter of the conflict, living in host communities and camps. In August 2020, the Borno state government announced and began plans to resettle those affected by the conflict to other communities across the state where the government said houses and other amenities had been constructed or renovated to accommodate them. But the resettlement and camps uh, uh, closures so far have taken place without adequate notice or information and have left many people worse off. Well, for more on this, we're now joined by Enietie Ewang, who's a researcher at Human Rights Watch in Nigeria. Uh, thanks so much indeed for joining us. Uh, welcome to the program. Uh, hi, Peter. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. All right. So what exactly are you unhappy about as Human Rights Watch about these relocations? I mean, we're calling on the authorities to suspend them for now. Um, from the research that we've carried out in the course of the last few months, um, it's quite clear that the process that has been adopted towards closing these camps that are situated in Maduguri, the capital city of Burno State, and these camps which host uh, over 100,000 IDPs, um, the process has been inadequate. Uh, there's not been adequate time provided to the displaced persons. There's not been a lot of information or alternative options provided that will ensure that beyond uh, living in these camps, when as people move on, as the camps are closed by the authorities, that they can actually live dignified lives and they can pursue sustainable solutions to the problem of their displacement that do not leave them worse off. So, I mean, it's, um, it's been a really horrible situation for many of the people who've already had their lives uprooted and completely disrupted by the conflict, which has been ongoing for more than a decade. So, um, I mean, it is only morally and legally right for the authorities to do everything within their power to ensure that whatever solutions that they're proposing um, or whatever efforts that they're taking towards um, the Boko Haram conflict or towards sustaining um, the state or pushing for um, a post-conflict situation, the government has a duty to ensure that uh, they're sustainable for the IDPs who must be of paramount concentration in whatever actions they take. All right, so what has been, uh, what's played out actually on the ground? Uh, have in some of these uh, displaced people been relocated uh, without uh, a, a new housing? And where are they? So, I mean, the authorities uh, in their communication with Human Rights Watch said that they're giving people three options. The first of which is to... Um, you know, go to communities where the government had built houses. Um, but the problem with this particular option is the fact that, you know, there is not enough houses for the number of people who are going to be displaced. The government itself, in some of its presentations to humanitarian partners that we have had um, a, a glimpse into, have not provided the, 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 the actual amount of homes that, that they've been able to build in these communities. They've not provided that number to the public. Um, and also humanitarian partners have raised concerns that on their visits to many of these communities where the government has supposedly built homes, it's been a situation where families still are living in precarious conditions in makeshift homes and tents and, and because there no, there's not enough housing, right? And in all other situations where families have been allocated houses, but um, the actual owners of the houses came back to have them evicted. Um, so it's been a really dicey situation in terms of, of housing and, and the relocation to communities where the authorities claim infrastructure has been provided. Now, the second option the authorities are providing are for people to go back to their ancestral communities. 
Um, but then there's the question of whether or not these communities are secure, um, whether or not people can pursue livelihood sources that allow them to have dignified lives, and whether or not, um, you know, we will be dealing with an issue of secondary displacement where that community might not be, uh, might not be secure or, or comfortable enough for them to live in, and they have to move on to somewhere else. And, and the third alternative the government has proposed is for people to remain in Medjugorje and just find their way about the city. Now, there are concerns in terms of what sort of housing they might be able to get with the high cost of living in Medjugorje, um, and what sort of jobs or livelihood sources they might find to support themselves in, 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 in the city. And so, however you see it, you find that these alternatives are not foolproof. These options that the authorities have provided are not foolproof. Um, they're not sustainable, and they're not well thought out, unfortunately. How long have these uh, displaced persons been in these camps uh, that are, are facing closure? And is it better for them to stay in these conditions uh, a bit longer, or is it just becoming too untenable? And this is why the government perhaps is trying to move them urgently. It differs, right? Many of the individuals that I spoke to had been in the camps for anywhere between five to seven years. As you mentioned, the Boko Haram conflict has been ongoing for more than a decade, since 2009. So many people have different stories. They have had different experiences that have brought them to the camps at different points in time in the conflict. But many people have lived there for years. And, and the conditions in these camps are not tenable. Definitely, we all have to agree. Um, there's issues around access to food, access to um, proper housing structures, access to education, health care. Um, there are many concerns around, you know, just how precarious the conditions in these camps are. And I think another thing that I must point out is the fact that these IDPs, many of them, at least the ones that are, I've spoken to, they do not want to continue living in these camps. They want to return to their normal lives under the right conditions, under conditions of safety, under conditions where they're sure they can provide food and shelter for themselves and, and their loved ones. Um, and I guess that's where the question of what is tenable comes in. Um, now, I'm sure the authorities are, are, are trying to do, or I assume the authorities are trying to do what's best, but in this situation, What's best cannot be dictated by officials in the office who just come up with a date by which they will close the camp. Um, that is by no means tenable. Um, I think what would be a better solution is having a very consultative process, having a discussion with the IDPs, with other stakeholders, um, the INGOs providing life-saving assistance, um, humanitarian groups, uh, uh, human rights groups who really can speak to um, many of the rights issues that must be con considered as the authorities are looking for alternatives to the situation in the IDP camps. Um, and so these sort of arbitrary announcements, these sort of arbitrary decisions that do not take into consideration the holistic picture, um, they're quite concerning and, and I, I, unfortunately um, they might not be uh, the proper alternatives that we're seeking uh, when we're trying to move people from uh, the conditions in, in these IDP camps. What have the authorities offered as an explanation uh, in doing this uh, in what looks like a hurried and unplanned manner? Um, so, I mean, I've spoken with a uh, representative of the Bernou State Ministry that is in charge of the camp soldiers. And in our communication, he basically said that, um, you know, the government is first and foremost looking to ensure that people live more dignified lives and that the conditions in the camp were deplorable. And that's something that we all agree on. But I guess the point where we start to disagree is what other conditions people will face when they go back to various places outside of the camp. Um, and then the other reason that he proffered was the fact that uh, the government had hosted these IDPs in, in camps, um, but in actual fact, these camps were actually housing estates or other facilities that the government now requires access to. Um, 
and and so must now move people away from these facilities. And the third um, answer that he provided was the fact that uh, people have to be resilient. They have to go back into their communities and, and, and farm and ensure that the state is economically viable. They have to contribute in quote to, 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 to the um, GDP of, of, of the state. Now, I mean, maybe to the authorities, these reasons sound tenable or they sound like, you know, um, just good enough to yeah. uproot thousands of people. But I mean, I think we, we must come to a point where we, we, we weigh these um, reasons, these are these, the lives and, and the security and um, just the, the dignity that people must be, be, be accorded uh, and, and, and decide which, which definitely is, is more important. All right, perhaps finally, and I think you've been hinting uh, throughout the conversation. Uh, look, Boko Haram is at the center of uh, the conflict and why these people were displaced in the first instance. Is Boko Haram still a prominent security threat? I mean, absolutely, it, it is a threat. Um, there's been a number of changes in over this last year um, that have made the dynamics of the conflict a little different from what we know now in northeast Nigeria. Um, but by all means, Boko Haram is still a threat. We have um, the breakout fraction, the Islamic State West Africa province, playing more of an active role in the region. And uh, their tactics have been relatively different from the original group. Uh, they are uh, focused on attacks against military forces and less against civilians. We also find that uh, the, the, the Islamic West Africa problems, they are also um, interested in really winning the hearts and minds of the civilians, and that also accounts for the reduced attacks against them. But it's not foolproof. Many times civilians get caught in between crossfire between the, the armed operating groups and uh, the military forces, um, civilians also bear the brunt of, um, you know, the repercussions of their actions in, in one way or the other uh, from the armed operating groups. Um, so security is, is still a concern, and people are still very much afraid of, of uh, going back to some, some areas where they feel like the government has not really been able to regain excellence or, or um, really great control. Annie Etye Ewang, researcher at the Human Rights Watch in Nigeria. Thank you so much indeed for joining us and uh, bringing this story to our attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks.